Let's start again, please. Tempest will fidget on down the road and we'll be out of it. Okay, so now just to reaffirm my last point. Not, this is not a law, it's, but if you want to get a hold of this whole process of transformation, you work primarily with your body and your mind. Now there will be other things that come up. And in some cases you have people who can't do anything. That's why disciplines are not the answer to everything. Because you find some people who simply can't get a hold of it anyway. And the extreme case of that is possession. There is such a thing as possession. And maybe a few degrees of it this way. <laughs> That's where it's important to have ministers and teachers and friends who know what that is. Sorry to thank you so much for that book. That's a wonderful book. Um, so just I want to make sure you got that. Okay, now you can reject it. Anything that I emphasize like that, you can. You have to decide whether or not it's true and whether or not you're going to do anything about it. I have abandoned trying to get anyone to do anything. <laughs> right? It's not my business. So try to think about that now. And then the issue of character. You see, when, when uh, uh, Tyson said, I just blew it. Well, that's his character. He was trying to say, that wasn't me. That was him, all right. Yeah. See, just blowing it is a feature of character. Now, I wanted to add to that, that in all of this, the human being alone is not going to be able to turn into some sort of grand moral mechanism that never does anything wrong. Okay. Let's just put that aside. Don't worry about that. We're not talking about being perfect. We're talking about doing a lot better. And you know the bumper sticker, Christians aren't perfect. They're just forgiven. That's just right up there with Tyson. <laughs> because there's an awful lot of distance between being just forgiven and being perfect. <clears throat> And we can go there, and it's really good to be there, and that's where Jesus wants us to be with Him. Yes? Yeah, the, the sense of, of restraining will and habits, where Tyson, for instance, he says, oh, that's not me, there's a part of you that nurtures that idea of biting someone's ear off, and then there's another part that that's right. to restrain it. Mm -hmm. So when the, when the one goes away, then the, the, the part that's, that's right. always there comes forward, mm -hmm. which is very different than having habits that... That yeah. Harbor bitterness and, and evil against somebody. That's right. That's right. And actually, uh, let's say a good word for Mike. I mean, that was better than saying, yes, and the next time I'll bite his other ear off. Right? That would have been worse, wouldn't it? Because that would have revealed still a different character. Okay, so now these, these are important things to think about. Because you remember, one of the things we have in Romans 7 is, it was not me. It was the sin that dwells in me. Now that can be a realistic approach to dealing with the problem, which is what it is in Romans 7 and 8. Because he goes on to deal with the problem in Romans 8. And actually he was dealing with it in Romans 6 before he got to 7. And it's a wonderful development to see how that, how that works. Um, now, we need to go back and think about the body some more. So let me put up a little <coughs> ding fod here. So we start, we've, we said some of this already, but let's, let's do it again. What is the body? It is potential energy that is immediately available to me. Okay, see, see that finger? I can move that. 
and I don't have to use something else to move it. Right? Now, um, the radio on my car, I cannot move like I can move my finger. Probably there's going to be something like that pretty soon. Because increasingly, uh, mind brain reading is going to be, but you still, it's your brain. Right? They have, now they have these computer programs where people can type words by moving their eyes and uh, the computer picks up what to do. You see how that ties into this because you see that means now you can move bodies that are not your own by thinking. Hmm? And that's a, that's a big step. Uh, much that we have in, in medicine restoring people or extending their abilities and so on are simple ways of accessing bodies that are not our body without our body. Now, until something happens, you can move or control much of your body without a body. I, I could take this hand and move this finger. Okay. Now, the important thing to understand is that your body is directly accessible to your will. And that's how you extend your will out into the world. So because you can use the body directly, it has potential energy that is available to you to act, then you can use your body to act, activate other bodies. And that, in short, is the story of technology. From fire and the wheel up to today. Okay, now... We can do this, we can use this body even in defiance to God. In order to be a person, I have to have a kingdom, and God has given me a body in order that I might have a kingdom. That's how that works. Persons require a kingdom, and human persons require a body to have a kingdom. And because they have the body, they can defy God they have enough energy in their body to do that. And of course, the particular body that I have enters into my identity forever. Right? Because the, what I will be after my death is defined by who I was before my death. And that is defined in terms of the body that I had. And that's a part of my personality. It has never, never escaped. That's one reason why it's hard to make a go of reincarnation. Because reincarnation su suggests that you have an identity separate from your body. So that you can sort of change bodies like you change coats. Hmm? So I don't want to take all that on right now, but it does turn out to be important because, in fact, for various reasons, reincarnation is asserting itself as an interesting issue for evangelical theology. Isn't that true? And that's related to universalism. The idea that if you just go around enough times, you'll get it right, eventually. Not really a correct view of human personality. Now, my fle as flesh, my body carries the natural abilities that en enable human beings to act. And that goes up to things like devising large, mellow, pink envelopes. And feeling, an, oh, I want to put more in that envelope. That's flesh. That's natural. Nothing wrong with it. 
Okay, flesh is not in itself bad. Not in itself bad. Only when it is unsubordinated to God is it bad. Are we doing okay up to that point? All right, now. Our body takes on a life of its own, and that's what it's supposed to do. That means you don't have to think about things in order to do them. Your body is not just a piece of meat. It is full of meanings. Full of meanings for you and for others. Meanings are things that carry you in a direction. Uh, the James passage is a nice discussion about how a process moves with sensations because the sensations takes on meanings as to what is next so that you don't have to think about the next move. You remember that structure? See, you know, I think that's one of the most important things to get out of the reading. And I want, I want to go back and look at some of the passages in that a moment. The basic idea is a human being, is, his body is built in such a way that it can just pile up almost endless sequences of, of sensations and actions that have meaning that lead over into the next thing. And that's illustrated in many, many ways, and he's such a good writer, and he, d he did a good job of that. But now, unfortunately, it has bad meanings, too. So, the idea of the sin which is in my members that Paul talks about, he was already where James was. Except he didn't understand the physiology of the body. James was a physiologist. First, of, That was his first career was as a physiologist. And he moved on to psychology next and finally philosophy, all within the faculty of Harvard University. So he's doing it in terms of physiology, but Paul knew the fact. He just didn't know how to analyze it. He knew the fact. And the, the body, unfortunately, is able to run on its own in the wrong direction. Not only in the wrong direction, contrary to our intentions. Now that's where you need, in order to understand what goes wrong and what goes right, that's where you need to get the complexity of the self, the human self. You need to have some understanding in it and that will help you see more deeply uh, that discipline's work and how they work. So there is a system of tendencies away, for, away from, should be from instead of for, or against God. Now the general name for that system in the scripture is world. So you have three enemies laid out in Ephesians 2. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Those are the, the big three. And in the early church, and many times you had to explicitly forswear them and say, I will stand against them. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world is organized flesh. Socially organized, historically developed flesh. That's the world as used in Ephesians 2 and elsewhere. Of course, there are other meanings of world, and I'm sure you know that. John says there are three things in the world. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, you have to understand that he's talking about those as ongoing processes that are just working away all the time. Lust is, of course, desire, and desire is essentially chaotic and disintegrative, and we have a lot of them, and one reason why you can't run your life on desire is because you do have a lot of them, and they conflict. And if you try to run your life on desire, you will be in a mess quickly. Lust of the flesh, 
basically physical desires. Lust of the eyes, basically appearance, style. Um, there's a little bit of power in that you want a room with a view and you want to look good and so on. That's the lust of the eyes. And the pride of life is exultation over others. Comparison, envy, resentment, manipulation. That's an old John looks at the world, says, that's it, folks. So if you want to be the friend of the world, you can't be the friend of God. That's what he said. And that's because this mess is running in the wrong direction. See, uh, Peter's case is always illustrative, and you see in his case what Paul was talking about when he said, the sin that is in my members. And they, it was in Peter's members. Jesus knew that. And he had to give Peter a little lesson in psychology. And so he took Satan's desire to sift Peter like wheat. And got to jump on Satan. And told Peter what was going to happen. So that when it happened... He would know what had happened. And he would be able to learn from it. Jesus was always teaching. When he says to the guys asleep in the garden, you know, he says, the spirit is willing. Spirit. But the flesh is weak. Where was the problem? It wasn't in the spirit. These guys were well-meaning. They intended to do what was right. And Jesus is teaching them where the problem is. And then that's set down in the scriptures so that we could also learn from this. He wasn't scolding them. I think often that's the way that's read. He was scolding them, you know. He, he wasn't saying something like, you know, if you had the brains God gave a goose, you'd stay awake. <laughs> he was teaching and then that's recorded for our benefit. And uh, I, I don't have time to go into that passage now, but it's a very important and good one for you to study and to think about. And, and do, do understand, he honored their intentions. He didn't question it. He just said, guys, there's more to it than that. There's more to it than that. Now then you go into... Peter's situation in the denials with the understanding that we're working through here and you can understand exactly why it happened. What was Peter standing? And he was standing in the world. It was all around him. The social consciousness of the servants and everyone and the study of what happened to Jesus in that setting is so instructive indeed. I mean, a person in that position is one who the people who always get beaten up can go beat somebody up. And the servants slapped him and mistreated him. The ones always on the other end, now they had a chance to do that to somebody. That's the world. That's a revelation of the nature of the world. And uh, it's not of God. So... Uh, you have the various factors you could find in Peter. No doubt he was confused. He was isolated from uh, others. He was weary. He was very conscious of death. Fear, anger, shame. No doubt rationalizing. He could easily have said, I just blew it. See, uh, but his character wasn't that. So, now I'm hoping you can analyze that and then take that to other situations you know where it looks very like a crucifixion is going on, where people are standing up or not standing up, 
and analyze and come to understand. And of course, we look at ourselves. Why do I behave the way I do? Yes, sir. There's um, also the satanic element going on here. I'm wondering what. There's a which? Satanic. Element. Satanic, yes. I'm wondering what element of the person demonic forces try to influence primarily. Primarily the mind. So, what would that look like for this situation with Peter? What kind of things do you think were happening? Well, primarily confusion. He didn't know what was happening. And then, what would be the best way to. You remember Jesus, remember now, this, is, this doesn't, like, you always have to see the continuity. After G Peter confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, what happened? Jesus said, you know, I'm going up to Jerusalem, they're going to kill me. And Peter, now, you have to fill in the blanks on Peter on that event. You can almost see him standing over here by a tree and saying, Jesus, I want to talk to you. That's not for you. That's not the way it works. Now you see, you have to have that in mind when you go to his denials. See, the way he was thinking, Satan's work is primarily on ideas. Okay, primarily on ideas. That's, that's true in general. That's why he works on institutions like education and the church. Because he knows that if he can get the ideas going, he can take a nap and things will go in his direction. And that's why your ministry as a teacher and a writer and a speaker is so important. You are idea people. You're not emotion people. Okay? Please understand that. You are idea people. Emotions come and go. They have some importance. But even in worship, worship isn't emoting. Worship is knowing God. Setting Him before you. Contemplating Him. And then emotion comes out of that. So, that's an important question. Peter was, I mean, the biggest fact about Peter was he was confused and he didn't know what was going on. And he probably thought when he said, I'll die for you, that he would kill somebody. But now comes a little girl. <clears throat> ah, you want to know. No, no, no. What are you going to do? Kill her? No. And he's, his confusion undermines his intentions and then the emotions of fear and social rejection and so on come in. And that's where you get his denial. Now he didn't know that was going to happen to him. He thought he, all he had to do was just decide. But it wasn't. That's what Jesus said. Jesus, and that's why Jesus set him up and taught him the way he did. And Peter had a hard time later with keeping straight on things. Now just this last point, because the body is fundamentally social it's the meaning that is in the body's positions and motions and that are read in others around them that function especially as triggers for actions that we later bewail ourselves about. We have to learn to play to the audience of one. And that's the only thing that can stabilize the individual in the social context. I stand before God. 
the audience of one. Now that goes back, of course, to the thoughts and the body. Well, there's a lot more we can say about that, but we can't because we have to do something else. I do want to recommend to you that you carefully study chapter 15 in William Law. It's ostensibly about why we should sing psalms. But it's really about the connection between the soul and the body. And you can read person and the body if you wish. It is one of the best things ever written on the understanding of what makes spiritual disciplines matter. It isn't just about psalms, but it is about singing psalms, about singing. And uh, the point of it is that what we do with our body influences what we have in our spiritual side, our soul, if you wish. He uses soul as simply a general term for all that's not the body. And that's one use that spiritual has. And uh, it, is, uh, it, is, it is the best treatment in the literature of this. I don't have your version, unfortunately, but I would like to just read a few lines here. Uh, he says, As the devotion of the heart naturally breaks out into outward acts of prayer, so outward acts of prayer are natural means of raising the devotion of the heart. It is thus in all states and tempers of the mind. As the inward state of the mind produces out actions suitable to it, so those outward actions have the like power of raising an inward state of mind suitable to them. You ever read an old book called From Prison to Praise? Sometime, look it up in the library. There was a period three or so decades ago where people dis rediscovered that praise would actually do you good. <laughs> and of course it's the same thought here. Therefore, if you would know the reason and necessity of singing psalms, you must consider the reason and necessity of praising and rejoicing in God because singing psalms is as much the true exercise and support of the spirit of thanksgiving as prayer is the true exercise and support of the spirit of devotion. The union of soul and body is not a mixture of their substances as we see bodies united and mixed together, but consists solely in the mutual power that they have of acting upon one another. That's the union of the soul and the body. William Law was a person who understood that they are two substances, they're not one, and yet they are interactive and in a manner that is appropriate to the subject matter then he describes how that works. The soul has no thought or passion, but the body is concerned in it. The body has no action or motion, but what in some degree affects the soul. And uh, so the other disciplines also related to the union of the body and the soul uh, have that same character of interaction. Well, he goes on to elaborate uh, on how this affects things like being surrendered to the will of God and so on. Uh, he has a wonder, wonderful passage here. Would you know who is the greatest saint in the world? It is not the one who prays most or fasts most. It is not he who gives most alms or most eminent for temperance. But it is he who is always thankful to God, who wills everything that God wills, who receives all that God does, everything as an instance of God's goodness and has a heart always ready to praise God for him. 
all prayer and devotion, fasting and repentance, meditations and retirement, all sacraments and ordinances are but so many means to render the soul thus divine and conformable to the will of God, to fill it with thankfulness and so on. You need not now therefore wonder why I lay so much stress on singing a psalm. The psalms were the original praise psalms. Since you see it is a form, it is to form your spirit to such joy and thankfulness to God as is the highest perfection of the divine and holy life. So I hope you will really look at chapter 15. And uh, you learn a lot about what you need to know about the role of the body. Now then, a little bit on James, and then we must talk about fasting. So if you take your reading, I just want to point out a few things. And uh, as I said, James was originally a physiologist. And he approaches the entire matter of habit from a physiological point of view. But you want to realize that for him, the body and especially the nerves are not just matter. They are living substance and while all matter yields to habit, the substance of the nervous system in his view, which he was very familiar with, at the level that you could be familiar with it at his time, that level, that nervous system has a special property uh, which he calls on page 151 plasticity. Plasticity. You'll see that a italicized word. Uh, plasticity then in the wide sense of the word means the possession of a structure weak enough to yield to an influence but strong enough not to yield all at once. And so he says, organic matter, especially nervous tissue, seems endowed with a very extraordinary degree of plasticity of the sort. Now, the English of all that is simply that it undergoes a process which it retains. And um, it doesn't just disappear, but it changes uh, in a way that you have a, an after effect. So the italicized language there on 151, that the phenomena of habit in living beings are due to the plasticity of the organic material of which their bodies are composed. Now from the point of view of what we're teaching here, that's a way of explaining the role of the body in the spiritual life. The body takes on meanings, which are tendencies, from the experiences that it goes through. And then he goes on to illustrate this in the following paragraphs in terms of things that are made out of metal or paper or cloth, and how they too retain a certain substance but change so that they are not the same, and they don't act the same. A simple illustration he gives is folding a piece of paper. If you fold a piece of paper once, then open it up, and try to fold it in a different place, close to the fold that you made, you'll find it's difficult. You've, you've no doubt folded a letter in the wrong place so it wouldn't go into the envelope, and then you had to fold it again. And sometimes it's quite a proposition to get it folded in the right place because it's already been folded. Well, that is an illustration in non-living matter of what James calls a habit. So now in the nerves, at the bottom of 152, you see the paragraph there, the italicized heading, 
habits are due to pathways through the nervous system. Whenever you have a sensation or an experience that establishes in some measure a pathway which is easier for the following experiences to go down than making a new pathway. And uh, nervous matter, as he calls it, it's not nervous, but it makes you nervous, um, is uh, especially uh, given to this trait of picking up, picking up patterns. Uh, on 153, a third of the way down, the most complex habits, do you see that language? The most complex habits, as we shall presently see more fully, are from the same point of view, nothing but concatenated, sort of piled one upon another, discharges of the nerve centers due to the presence there of systems of reflex paths, so organized as to wake each other up successfully successively sorry so now the effects of this right at the bottom of page 153 habit simplifies our movements makes them accurate and diminishes fatigue and he goes on to illustrate that then on the next page 154 the bottom of that page habits diminish the conscious attention which our acts are, with which our acts are performed. And that's one of the main things, is that you don't have to pay attention to all the stuff that you would have had to if you didn't have a habit. Now, again, you see, that's good and that's bad. If you have a habit of not looking over your shoulder before you change lanes, it's not good. Unless you've made some other effective arrangements, of course. So now then he gives us the little picture uh, of a of what happens uh, in a process and he describes this um, on the bottom of 154 and 155. Right at the bottom he, he gives you a general description here. If an act requires a chain A, B, C, D through G, then in the first performance of the action the conscious will must choose each of these events from a number of wrong alternatives that tend to present themselves. But habit soon brings it about that each event calls up its own appropriate successor without any alternative offering itself and without any reference to the conscious will. Now, if you have, as an adult, learned a second language, or if you, for example, have, are a pianist or a musician, you know exactly what this means. Because the, the whole effect of practice and training is to establish these successions where you don't have to think about the links in the chain. And then he presents that graphically on page 156. Now the outcome here on page 157, the paragraph opening there, habits depend on sensations not attended to. He's using the word sensations in a rather generous manner. Uh, but really he's talking about any kind of mental event. You could feel it or not. But habit runs on in events that you're not conscious of. In some cases you could be, but in most cases you're thankful not to be because you've got other things to think about. And the result of that is it frees us up. On page 158 you have a italicized sentence there towards the top. The simultaneous combination of movements is thus in the first instance conditioned by the, fa the facility with which in us, alongside of intellectual processes, processes of inattentive feeling may still go on. Now, see, if you've got the idea here, 
then you can put uh, Peter's denials right on this. And then the positive things, you see some, someone, a pianist playing some incredible piece of music. Beethoven's Appassionata Sonata is a good illustration. You look at them and you think, how can they do that? Well, I knew a pianist once who said, if I don't practice for one day, my teacher knows it. If I don't practice for two days, I know it. And if I don't practice for three days, everybody knows it. Yeah. Because even though these processes do, they have to be sustained. But not directly, you do it by practice. James has a wonderful thing to say about that, a little further on here. But now just a word or two about um, the ethical and pedagogical importance. This is on 158. And what he's talking about here now is how does this affect the general field of moral education as well as other forms of education. There's some nice remarks here on 58 and 59 about how society runs on habit. Again, it's not all good because, as he comments, a person brought up in certain circumstances may be limited to that position in society forever simply because their habits won't, move, won't let them move. He tells fascinating stories here about the tiger, for example, that is being carried on a train and have a train wreck and the cage is open and the tiger comes out and looks around a little bit and just goes back in. <laughs> and uh, you know, you can train an elephant to a stake and it will stay there even if the chain is not on it. If chickens are used to a fence, they'll walk right up to it and turn around and go the other way when the fence is not there. And it's very touching to think about these kinds of things, but he has a nice discussion of this on, for, for human beings mainly on pages 158 and 159. So now, he, on, the, on page 160, 160, he begins to reap the fruits of it, of the discussion with his statement at the top of the page. The great thing in all education is to make our nervous system our ally instead of our enemy. It's to fund and capitalize our acquisitions and live at ease upon the interest of the fund. He was a grand old writer. He had a way of using illusions that just so you get the right habits and you just live on the interest. <laughs> and there's, there's so much truth to that, uh, negatively as well as positively. And then he uh, quotes from a, a man named Bain, who was a psychologist and philosopher contemporary to him, a number of points, about two-thirds of the way down on 160, the first point. In the acquisition of a new habit or leaving off of an old one, we must take care to launch ourselves with as strong and decided an initiative as possible. And I want you to be thinking about what you do in disciplines as we go over this. Um, a discipline usually takes a fairly radical amount of novelty and it's important that it do so. You'll find many people who have done well as followers of Christ, at their conversion, they often entered into an intensive period of solitude and Bible study and other things that may have been relevant. The second maxim is never suffer an ex exception to occur till the new habit is securely rooted in your life. Right? And, of course, again, you have to be able to do that. You have to, not everyone can do that, but he's talking about people who are basically sane and whole and want to do better. And that is one of the things you do. You, you don't tolerate exceptions. Right? Now, 
for people who are not in a strong position, for example, in smoking or whatever they're taking, coffee, my drug of choice. Uh, if you want to get off of it, get off of it. And he has some discussions here about the tapering off method and all of that. But basically, if you revert, you just reestablish the pattern. Your brain says, okay, I know that one. <laughs> and we're going to do that again. And uh, so it's important that you not give in. And I know people who have quit heroin, heroin cold turkey because they basically followed James's and Professor Bain's response. And you say, well, it's hard. Well, yeah, what else is new? It's hard. But if you want to change your habits, you do it. And that is when you know the history of, of uh, the Christian people, you, you see how often uh, this is practiced. And it was especially true in the orders such as Benedictine and other orders. Next, uh, on page 162, a third maxim may be added to the preceding pair. Seize the very first possible opportunity to act on every resolution you make. And on every emotional prompting you may experience in the direction of the habits you aspire to gain. Now, in a minute, we're going to turn to fasting and talk about that. But it applies to every discipline. It is a matter, discipline is a matter of taking the opportunities that life offers you to establish new habits. And you have some liberty uh, in selecting those. Uh, but that is, that is really essential, and you will find that, for example, silence is something you can practice, and in many forms. And it's very important for those of us, people like you all and me, who fundamentally are word people. That's what we do, is words, one context or another. It's not bad. On the other hand, it can be bad. You read James and you find out the tongue is a fire. So, you can practice silence in many ways. For example, one of the ways that, again, people such as you or I can practice is not having the last word. We can practice that at church, we can practice it in our family. And it's a marvelous discipline. Other people will be frightened and disoriented around us if we don't do that, but they'll get some help from it too. So you take every occasion that is reasonable, and one of the important things about fasting is it's very frequently that you have the occasion where you can practice it. Now, on page 156, he is talking about effort that goes into it, and, and he's, I want to make this bridge to the chapter on will that we will do tomorrow. So please, if you would, remember to bring that with you tomorrow. But he says here on page 164, six lines in, attention and effort are, as we shall see later, but two names for the same psychic fact. Fascinating. Extremely important. When you start to fast, if you're not already used to it, the first thing you'll do is spend all your time thinking about food. Bad idea. <laughs> To what brain process they correspond, we don't know now, he said that. The strongest reason for believing that they do depend on brain process processes all is that the, and are not pure acts of spirit is just this fact, that they seem in some degree subject to the law of habit 
And now he says, which is a material law. I want to say to you, this is one point on which I hope you will think, if not disagree, with James. All of reality is subject to habit. Thoughts, emotions, and they are not subject to habit just because they are connected with the brain. They are realities in their own right, and it's especially important to know that they also respond to habit. Like my students at USC now, and I suspect everywhere else, can hardly read a book by William Law. And if they try to read something by Jonathan Edwards, they're dead. <laughs> because their habits are to do little bitty bites. And now we have a sentence that goes a page and a half. <laughs> but that's habit. Because the people who read Jonathan Edwards had no problem. They weren't watching TV and so forth, and that helps. But their habits, there were mental habits, their emotional habits. And so just put a little question mark by that comment about the brain there. The brain is obviously important, but not because the non-physical doesn't have habits. Now, one of my very favorite statements from James on discipline is in the next sentences there. He says, as a final practical maxim relative to these habits of the will, we may then offer something like this. Keep the faculty of effort alive in you by a little gratuitous exercise every day. That is, be systematically ascetic or heroic. Don't be thrown off with that word ascetic. Just read heroic. In little unnecessary points, do every day or two something for no other reason than that you would rather not do it. That is an absolute jewel. So that when the hour of dire need draws nigh, you may find you yourself not unnerved and untrained to stand the test. Asceticism of this sort is like the insurance which a man pays on his house and his goods. The tax does him no good at the time, and probably may never bring him a return. But if the fire does come, his having paid it will be his salvation from ruin. So with a man who has daily inured himself to habits of concentrated attention, energetic volition, and self-denial in unnecessary things, he will stand like a tower when everything rocks around him and when his softer fellow mortals are winnowed like chaff in the blast. Now, you, we've been looking at wisdom, not law. This is not righteousness. This is for people who want to, in a practical way, change their character. And when we are teaching we want to remember this. You probably can't use this in a sermon, but you need to have it in mind, and some of it can be conveyed to some people that you're teaching. And it's absolutely essential in the face of all of the plaintive statements, I can't, I can't. Well, there's grace and there's effort, and you can. It's a matter of finding out how to do it and putting into practice the things that would change. Okay, now a few words on fasting. Most importantly, what is fasting? It isn't just not eating. That is the negative side of it, and you have to do that to get to what it really is. Fasting is practicing dependence upon God. It is practicing dependence upon God. That is why I give you a couple of passages on that, because it ought to have something to do with the Bible. 
Deuteronomy 8, 3, and Psalm 35, 15. Okay? If you don't understand what fasting is, you won't be able to understand these verses. Deuteronomy 8 is the story of the Israelites in the wilderness. It says, um, it's a wonderful chapter. I have a hard time not getting sidetracked here. But let's talk about fasting. Verse 2, You shall remember all the way the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these forty years, that he might humble you. Testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandment. Keeping the commandment depends on something. How would humility, being humbled, get you there? That's the, you see the question? Keeping the commandment depends on something. What does it depend upon? Well, being humble. Why? Because being humbled is to be dependent upon God. It's to be dependent upon God. That is what humility is. If you read your Andrew Murray, you know how he develops that over and over. It's to be dependent upon God. Now, how did that work? He humbled you and let you be hungry. And fed you with manna which you did not know. You know what the word manna means? Bread of heaven. Hmm? Bread of heaven? Well, that's how it turns out. It means, what is it? <laughs> so, Junior, go out and gather another pot of what is it. Mm -hmm. We'll suddenly have some what is it soup. Manna is congealed word of God. Potatoes also are congealed word of God. Word of God is the substance which you consume when you fast. Now, it may take a little longer than one, one meal to get into this, but a, one meal is a good start. That he might make you to understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What proceeds out of the mouth of God? Words of God. In some forms, it, potatoes. But it doesn't have to have any material form at all, and that's what you are finding out when you fast. Because when you fast, you are taking in substance from the invisible landscape. You will notice here, verse 4, your clothing did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell, that is, it, it didn't wear out your shoes, for 40 years. What's that got to do with anything? Now, think E equals MC square, okay? You have that? You know that? You want to write it down in your notes so that you can think about this when you pray. Okay. The energy in a unit of matter is equal to the number assigned to it times the square of the speed of light. Where did Jesus get all those fish? He had the E and knew how to make the M. The M doesn't exhaust the E. In fact, the, phys the physical universe is a little bitty thing in a great big God. 
not the other way around, a little bitty God flitting around in a great big physical universe. So now when you sing that song we sung this morning to start out about the greatness of God, make sure you're sort of getting up there, okay? When you fast, you learn the reality of this to your body. And that aligns you with what God is doing. And what God is doing is what? What, what did you say that was? What God is, what is the kingdom of God? It's what God is doing. Now then, you come to know it and be aligned with it in an experiential way that shows up in your life. Shows up in your life. And I've had many, many, many generations of ministers go through my seminars and write back, something different is happening. I suggested to a group of ministers once that they might fast before they preached. One of them wrote me a letter and said, my lady that takes care of the tape says, I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it because the tape ministry has doubled and tripled. <laughs> now see, that's characteristic because this isn't something you can control. You can align yourself with it, but the effects are from another world. Incidentally, by the way, it will teach you how to remain sweet and strong when you don't get what you want. Would that be a plus? It totally goes against mom's good counsel of eat a good breakfast. No, it just tells you a little more about what breakfast is. And you will learn, is you have to grow in this, okay, because you have to, your mind has to get straightened out and all of that. And uh, uh, you will learn that you will not be hungry. You will feel differently, but you won't be hungry. After you learn, that's, now that's habit. You know, when you start, oh, I'm hungry, I'm going to die. <laughs> But in James's language, what happens is you simply develop a new train of sensations. And I would add in the spirit in the way that James doesn't, though he was not opposed to that by any means. I suspect you'll have to deal with him in heaven. He's a fascinating person to get to know. If you don't know William James, uh, you'll find it really interesting to know him. But it, see, it has all of these, dis remember a discipline what you do that enables you to do what you can't do by effort. Now we have to come back tomorrow and spend time specifically on discipline, what it is, because we have to go away from here with the concept clear and not just a list of things that we don't understand. But that's the basic idea. And now I say it because I want you to see that's what fasting is. Fasting is something that's in your power. Though when you start, you may think it's not. It is. That enables you to do what you can't do by direct effort. And among those things is being sweet and strong when you don't get what you want. And that's an aspect of the cross. But that only works because in fasting you are actually feasting on the invisible landscape.